So I can't really see anybody whilst I'm presenting. So if there's anything, um, just um, if you can let one of the the guys know. Um, so here I'm. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, we're doing this today's session in um, two parts. And there's a couple of firsts for me tonight. I've not never presented at a hybrid event. It's normally online or in and face to face. So this is a first for me. And I, I don't normally present in a lecture style. I will normally present um, and I'll get people involved. So this is a first, lots of firsts tonight. So I hope it runs smoothly and my apologies in advance if it doesn't. Um, so We've got lots to cover this. We're trying to cram lots in, so I'm just going to crack on and we'll get questions at the end. I can't actually see anybody at the moment, um, so if the team can maybe try and, I don't know, send me an email or something if you need me to do anything whilst I'm going through the, the presentation. So just to start off, we thought this first part, um, because there's so many things that we're trying to cover today, um, if we try to cover everything in the same session, then some people would be really bored because they've already done that, the, the start up part of the process, and some would be, um, some of it would go over their head if we had went to the second part, which is when we're going to cover governance and um, the things that you need to think about once you're an established organisation. So part one is for startups and we'll cover that over the next hour and then in this we'll have a short break and then in the second part we will cover um, uh, it will be a follow on from the startup or it will be for those organisations that are already up in existence and we'll have Q&A's at the end of the session I don't know the answer to everything, but I promise that if I don't have the answer to give you today, what I will do is go away and find it out and I'll share that with you after the session. Um, we have a lot of links that I've got to share with you and you guys will get the presentation afterwards. So just to start off with, um, constituting the, the term constituting. So lots of people talk about constitutions and constituting the group and if you're a startup, if you're new to this, you won't necessarily know what this means. Um, but constituting a group is basically when you, as a group, come together and you decide what your rules are, what your aims are, what what is it, why did the group come together to be in existence, and what parameters are you going to operate within? Um, and how you constitute that group is you write all of that up and you come up with a document and whatever there's lots of different names for that document it could be called the constitution it could be called articles of association or a trusted and it really depends on the type of organization that you're going to become and we will cover that in the slides coming afterwards um the term constituted doesn't mean that you're incorporated. It doesn't mean that when you constitute, you become a legal structure. All it means is that you've come together as a group and you've got written aims and objectives and rules that the group's going to follow. And some people get a bit mixed up with that. So you've constituted, you've got your rules, you've got your um, aims and objectives, you've got a group of people that may have come, they've got a passion for something either in the local community or it's a, a community of interest, maybe it's a health interest that you've got um, and you're coming together to do something for the good of that community or your local community. You've got your um, constitution document there now you need to be starting to think about what kind of legal structure it is that you want to have and some people don't realize that when they come together as a group they're an unincorporated organization and they think because they have a charitable aim that they are incorporated and it gets very confusing for people but so you've got your constitution first you are not at this moment in time incorporated or a legal structure in the eyes of the law currently what you are is you're an unincorporated 
unincorporated organisation. Um, with people that are going to run the organisation, generally um, on a voluntary basis. But if you're unincorporated, what that means is that if you take out a contract um, or if you lease something, that the responsibility lies with the individuals that are in that or in that group. So if they, if you if you set up a, a charitable organisation, you've come together. There's five of you there. You want to do lots of good for your organ for your community, um, and you've got your constitution, and you then. I don't know, you might want to lease some um, rooms, hire some rooms out. At this minute in time, as you're unincorporated, the liability lies with the individuals that have come together and because there is no legal entity that exists at this moment in time. So an unincorporated legal structure is a group of people that have come together to form an organisation, whether it be a charitable organisation or not. Um, and you will normally, um, the, the people will normally be called a committee or a board or trustees. Um, but the liability at this point lies with those individuals that come together. And I've come across quite a lot of community organisations that are they're set up to do really, really good things, but they don't realise the risk that they're putting themselves at as individuals because they are currently an unincorporated organisation. And so, and but for some organisations, being unincorporated is absolutely fine and it's the right structure for them. So it's about considering that risk and judging whether that risk is OK for you. So the types of organisation that it might be absolutely perfect for them to be unincorporated are organisations that they come together to talk about setting up um, events, for instance, but they're not actually so they might run things in the local um, charities or in partnership with local charities, but they're not actually going to be taking on any responsibility. They're not going to be taking on any um, contracts with anybody. They're not going to be employing anybody. They're not going to be leasing anything because they're working in collaboration with other charitable organisations. Um, so if you're unincorporated, you currently, the risk, the liability lies with you as a person and not as a group. There is no legal um, group um, in the eyes of the law. Okay. The difference between an incorporated legal structure is that when you become incorporated, you're no longer individuals. The liability no longer lies with you as individuals. It lies with the organisation. So that organisation um, can employ staff. They can deliver services. They can take out leases. You can rent property. And you are protected as the, um, the members of the group of the incorporated organisation because the liability lies with that organisation that has been set up. And generally that liability is, is to a pound. So a lot of the, the liability when you're a limited organisation, it's normally limited to a pound. And even if you're a community interest company, the liability will be limited to a pound. Now that liability is great as long as you are fulfilling all your roles and responsibilities as an organisation. Um, you wouldn't be protected, for instance, if you went against the law and you purposely broke the law or you purposely didn't adhere to the Charity Governance Code or the Director's Code, um, and that could be proven. So that liability there, that one pound liability there is there, but there are other things that you could be challenged for if you don't follow the proper policies and procedures of your organisation, of the Char Charity Commission, of Company House, whatever body you fall under. Um, so charity status, um, a lot of people think that charity status is a legal structure. 
and it's not. A charity status is a, it's a status that has been awarded to a body that has proven that it has charitable aims and that its objectives fall within the 13 descriptions that are outlined in the Charities Act. And the trustees of these organisations must um, carry out the charity purposes for public benefit. So that's called the public benefit requirement. And in the links that I've got for you, there's lots of links to find out further information. This today's session is just to give you an overview, maybe a wee refresher, um, maybe new tips um, that you haven't come across before. Um, so lots of links to that you'll get in the the handouts when you get them. So these are the 13 descriptions um, listed in the Charities Act and I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see it might be an idea if you have a look at them and think about where does your organisation fit in to these categories? Um, so for instance, my organisation would fit under A, the Prevention or Relief of Poverty, it will fit under um, the Advancement of Education and the advancement of citizenship or community development. And I've got our actual um, purposes in a future slide that I'll show you, I'll share with you, um, just to show you how it actually looks like. But so when you're setting up charities, these are the sorts of things that you need to be thinking about. Where is your organisation going to fit in to um, these categories and if your organisation doesn't fit into these categories then it's you're not going to be awarded charitable status. So having charitable status doesn't mean that you're an incorporated organisation. You could be an unincorporated group so you don't have any legal structure. All the risk lies with you as individuals but you have been awarded charitable status because of the aims of your organisation fall within these categories. OK. Um, and the good thing is that when you're setting up, it can be really, really frustrating and it's like where you can't see the wood for the trees, you don't know where to start. Where do you get, what do you put in these documents when you start to create a, an organisation? Even if you've went through that process and you know that you want to, you think you're charitable, you've got charitable aims, you fit within those 13 categories and you want to become a charity, you want to become incorporated. Where do you go next? How do you do it? How practically how do you do it? The good news is there's a lot of lot of information out there to help you, to support you. There's lots of videos out there on the Charity Commission site, the NCVOs, and that I've got them in the links for you so that you can, there's too much information almost. Um, so what I've tried to do in these slides is give you links to particular things that fall within those sections. So for instance, this, this here is sample documents and where to find them. So memorandums and articles of association, you would have these. The memorandum is on the left here. And you on the right, you'll see the a draft um, articles of a, a template articles of association. So what you do is you just go to these articles of association, you go to the memorandum and a lot of them have got guidelines as well for you to follow so it's some of it's self-explanatory some of it you need to go to the guidelines and look at and what you would then do is you'd go through these templates and you would cherry pick what fits your organization and there's so there's templates for companies that are wanting to set up as a limited company so that's just a you're not charity at this minute in time, you're just setting up as a limited company. Um, there's templates for that. The one underneath that is setting up a charity, the model government documents, and there's a link there. And there's in that link you've got there, there's links to all the different kinds of charitable organisation that you can set up. So this is just one example. And this example that I've got here 
is of a charitable incorporated organisation with voting members other than its charity trustees. And to the right of that, you can see there's a model document. And in the left hand corner of that document, you can see that there's no, you might not be able to see it's quite small, but there is notes and that's guidance notes for you when you're completing this document. So the Charity Commission, Companies House, Community Interest Company Association, they, they have all worked really hard to make it as simple and easy as it, as it possibly can be to help guide you through these processes. And of course, you've got Dover District Council. They offer support depending on where you are in your in the, the county. Um, and we've got a, a link and an email address for you in one of the future slides. Should you need further support, you can go back to um, Dover District Council to get that support as well. So th those first two were organised um, limited companies and charities. And this one is if you were going to set up a community interest company. And on the left, you've got the um, memorandum of the association and the memorandum of association it's just your it's your your notice your intention to set up that organization and generally you put in the founding members in that memorandum of association and then over to the sit the right hand side here on this slide we've got the CIC 36, so Declaration of a Formation of a Community Interest Company. And that's where you write what your community interest company statement is going to be and who your beneficiaries are going to be, what you're going to do locally in your community interest company. Um, and that's kind of similar to what you would you would send um, a statement in every Every year just to confirm what it is that you've been doing in that community interest company since the last year and the benefits that have been given to your beneficiaries during that past year so but again lots of guides videos on this uh, on the um, links that I've got here that take you through that process and if you need any further support come back to Dover District Council for for that support they can take through what's on offer. So we spoke about the unincorporated organi or, or organisation or unincorporated association. These organisations can be awarded charitable, organ charitable status or they can just be an unincorporated association that has no charitable purposes at all. The governing document that you would have for that would be just your rules of association, your simple constitution. Um, and I've put a link in here to a resource centre that's got different versions of simple constitutions. Now, there's no one bog standard constitution that you would use as an unincorporated organisation because there is the amount of unincorporated types of unincorporate, unincorporated organisation are vast. So it depends on the type of organisation that you are. It, you could be a, a local gardening association that's come together and the constitution that you've got is going to be completely different from a local charitable organisation that was set up to support people with lupus, for instance, or an organisation that was set up to um, look after the um, grounds within the community to make sure doing litter pickings and things like that. So there's a whole lot of different constitutions that you can use and there's there's templates galore out there. So it's just about looking for the right template. Today, it's just about giving you an overview of these are the sorts of things that you need to think about. And so that you come away from this session knowing that OK, we need to think about the rules. We need to think about the parameters within which we're going to work. What are we set up to do? And then let's get them put down in writing in our constitution. We know that's what it's called. And also when I, you're asked by funders, what's your constitution? Do you have a constitution? Yes, we've got a constitution and this is what it is. You can understand what it is. The other thing is that when you're setting up community bank accounts. So if you're a community organisation, you want to set up a, a bank account, 
most banks will ask you if you've got a constitution and they want to see a copy of that constitution before they set you up as a community organisation because lots of banks will give you really good rates. They'll give you free banking for a certain period or they may give you free banking indefinitely as long as you're within a certain um, income bracket. Um, so it's really important that you know what the constitution is or your articles of association or your um, yeah, your rules, your regulations, that's what it is. So the pros and, pros and cons of being an unincorporated org association is that the pros are that it's fast and it's cheap to set up. There's no set up fees unless you decide to involve a solicitor. Um, I, I personally haven't come across any unassociated organisations that have involved a solicitor. I don't actually know when you would you would want to do that, but there might be some occasions when you would want to involve a solicitor. So again, it's very, very personal to you, to your group, to your organisation. Um, another pro is that it offers flexible and democratic structure. So when you become a charity, it can you've there's rules and regulations as a charity that you've got to abide by when you become an organize an incorporated organization there's a company house rules you've got to abide by but as an unincorporated organization you use individuals your own liability lies with yourselves so there's less restrictions and there's less red tape for you to um jump through however with that less restrictions and less red tape there's more responsibility so it's about balancing those two things up to see what works for your organization unincorporated organizations are relatively easy to run at little cost um, most are you might do it by by you might make meet by um, zoom you don't need to have a a base to you might be working at each other's kitchens um, or homes or gardens so it's you've got less overheads with generally with an unincorporated association than what you would be when you incorporate however even incorporated organizations can keep their costs low so it's not it doesn't go hand in hand that you've got high costs if you incorporate the cons of it as i've mentioned many times before and I do this on purpose because I, I've come across many organisations that they don't realise that the liability lies personally with the members of the group, the trustee board, the committee, whatever it is that you're calling it. Um, and for some people that personal liability they can't afford it. So it's really good to be open and honest and upfront with people that if we're unincorporated, then we've got personal liability here if something goes wrong. And I'm just thinking about, as an example, my local community garden, um, unincorporated lease um, from the local um, landlord, the local housing association, and that lease, the liability for that lease lies with the person who signed that lease and not with the group because there is no group in a legal point of view. And there was a fire there and potentially that fire could have um, cost a lot of money and the, the, the housing association could have been looking for um, compensation and that compensation would have went back to that individual who signed that lease. Highly unlikely, but just giving you the the um, picture that potentially there could be adverse um, complications by having an unincorporated organisation. In theory, they could be liable to corporation tax, um, but unlikely. Um, but it, it it's it's a possibility, and again, it depends on the organisation and, and what it's what it's there to do and how much income it's com got coming in. If charitable, it can't register with the Charity Commission unless they've had they have an annual income of five thousand pounds coming in. So that's over the year five thousand pounds coming in and in income. If um you go over, if you reach that five thousand um 
threshold or go over it, you must register with the Charity Commission. Now, registering with the Charity Commission does not make you incorporated. It just means that you're registering with the Charity Commission if you have charitable aims and you have went over that £5,000 threshold of income. So you've made £5,000, which is great. That's a great start. You want to make £5,000 and more, but you just need to remember once you get to that threshold, you need to register with the Charity Commission if you have charitable aims. And again, they're really, really good. The Charity Commission isn't there to catch you out. The Charity Commission is there to work with you. And if you don't do things that you're supposed to do, um, my advice to you is to go and tell the Charity Commission and confess to them because what they're going to do is they're going to work with you to fix it they're not going to um come down on you like a ton of bricks unless you've done it 100 million times before and you haven't fixed what you they've asked you to fix in the, the past so use the charity commission you can phone them up you can email them i phoned up several times this year had a lovely conversation with um the advisors on the other end of the phone and you, it's quite quick to get that um, feedback back or email them if you they're only there through a certain time period during the day so email might be your better bet to do it to get in contact with them but use them because they're there they've got a vast amount of information and they can signpost you to places if you don't know where to go um the next thing the next setup that we're going to look at is a charitable company so this is an organisation that has been set up as a company limited by guarantee. Um, so the limit is like we were talking about earlier, one pound if anything goes wrong, as long as we've adhered to the um, charity governance um, principles, the charity governance code, there's that limit. And you will have, and or you should have for these organisations, another thing you need to think about is liability insurance. So you can get trustee um, liability insurance from insurers that just give an extra level of protection to your trustees on top of that one pound limited guarantee. So have a look at what kind of insurance do you have to have when you're setting up your organisation. And again, there's loads of insurers, insurance companies out there. I might have one or two links in the links that I've got, I'm, I can't quite remember. Um, but there's, there's insurers that are set up specifically to help with charities. Um, but there's other insurers, if you're just a, a company set up, a limited guarantee company. When I had a limited guarantee company, I used Hiscock um, and Policy B is a good one. So Hiscock was the underwriters and Policy B were the, um, the brokers, if you like. And again, this is what they do every day. They have this knowledge because that's what they do every day. Just like the knowledge you have, you've got loads of knowledge of your everyday um, things that you do, that's what they do. So they're the experts, go and talk to them, tell them what it is that you do, and they will advise you what kind of insurance that you need. Um, and then once you've got that, that information, you can then go and shop about and find the best price for the insurance that you need. So the governing document for a charitable company is the Articles of Association from the Charity Commission and the Memorandum of articles of association um, from Companies House. Now, memorandum and articles of association for Companies House, you might hear someone talk to you about mem and arts. So when people are, if you hear that term, mem and arts, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about your memorandum and your articles of association. Now, your memorandum is just that piece of paper we spoke about earlier of your intention to form a company and potentially the um, founding members. And then your articles of association are your rules and the parameters within which you're going to work your aims of that organisation. So for this, you're a charitable company, you're registered with the company's house and with the Charity Commission. And so you've got to report back to both of them. 
Um, and you will find that lots of charities that were set up probably about six, seven years and before that have been set up as a limited company and registered with the Charity Commission because that was all that they were able to do at that point. But that has been, um, it's not been replaced because some people are still, still have the, those that were registered originally as that still have them unless they have converted to what we now have as a charitable incorporated organisation which you may know of as a CIO. So a CIO is an organisation that doesn't, it's doing the same sort of thing as a charitable company that's also a limited company but it doesn't have to report back to the two organisations and we'll come to, to the two bodies um, and we'll come to that in a minute. Um, but years ago you weren't able to do that so if you wanted to trade as a charity you had to set up as a limited company and a charitable organisation registered with the Charity Commission. So the pros of that was the registration is straightforward and it's relatively low fees. You can get certain tax reliefs from being a charity, um, reduced business rates, you can claim gift aid on donations, you can have employees and own land or property because you're incorporated, it's the organisation, so you can take out those um, those leases, those contracts, you can get enter into contracts with your local authority, CCGs, um, liability for trustees is limited, generally that one pound, might be five pound, might be one pound. Have a look at your governing document or consider that when you're setting it up. Um, the cons of this is that you've got your regulation to do bodies, so you've got your reporting to two bodies. So reporting to one body is bad enough. This way you're reporting to two bodies, and that's why they brought in the community interest, the sorry, the charitable incorporated organization, the CIO, a few years back. One thing to look out for and to watch out for is we a limited company. You can get really high penalties if you don't file your information with Companies House on time. And um, we've got there it's between 150 and 1,500. It depends on how late your return goes in. So if you've just missed that date, it might be 150 pound that you've got to pay. And the longer it goes on the higher your fine goes um, and it can go up and up and um, you don't want that to happen. Particularly in this current climate where the cost of living and everything, money's really precious normally, but it's even more precious at this minute in time. The other thing that you can't do um, with this setup is you there's restrictions on the type of trading that you can do and there's restrictions on campaigning. So if, if you're wanting to trade a campaign, then you've got to look into, is this the kind of setup that's suitable for your organisation? OK. Um, the next one that we're going to cover is the Charitable Trust. I'm going to do this really quickly. It's a trust deed from the Charity Commission that you would get. There's a link there to model trust deeds in the, the table there. The pros is that you qualify for some of the same tax benefits that you would if you were a char as a charitable um, companies do. The, the cons are that um, trustees are responsible for any debt, so um, similar to the unincorporated organisation. They cannot employ any staff or enter into any contracts and it doesn't have any separate legal status. So. Um, the sort of things, the sort of organisations that might set up as a charitable trust are organisations or groups of people that have come together because they might have had a legacy has been left by someone who's left money, a legacy and they want to set up a trust. Um, and there, so you have like with the funding, charitable trusts sometimes give out funding to small, medium sized organisations in the community to fulfil the aims that they were set up to. So if it was if they were set up for the relief of poverty, then they would want to give on those funds to small charities that can actually go out and deliver the benefit to relieve that poverty in the community. So that's the kind of 
organisation that would use this kind of structure to set up. Moving on quickly, um, I'm just conscious of the time, keep looking at the clock. Um, company limited by guarantee and shares. So we spoke about that earlier. We touched about that when we were talking about the limited by guarantee, but also registered as a community, uh, as a charity with the Charities Commission. So this is just your pure company limited by guarantee or by shares. Um, you have a memorandum of a, a memorandum and articles of association. The link to the template documents are in there. Pros are that registration is straightforward, relatively low fees, so similar to the ones that we spoke about before. You can have employees and own land or property. You can enter into contracts to deliver services. Um, you can, and, and the liability lies with directors is limited. So again, that one pound limited um, that we spoke about before, which is generally the the limitation that you put on that um, liability. But again, get your insurance, look at your different insurances and depending on what kind of service that you're offering, you might want employer's liability insurance, you might want um, public liability insurance, you might want um, professional indemnity if you're advising, if your service is providing advice and guidance to other organisations. So it's really dependent on the kind of organisation that you're setting up as to the kind of insurance that you would need. But look at it, make sure that's one of the things that you consider. Cons is high penalties. Again, if you don't put your company's house um, information in on time, you're going to get those penalties. So stay away from those penalties because they add up really, really quickly and you don't want that. Community interest company. So this community interest company was brought in um, many, not many years ago. I can't remember when it was brought in, but it was brought in because there were lots of people that were setting up charitable organisations because they had the passion to set this up. They wanted to come together and support or community or a community of interest. But then the the problem that they had is all the time that they were donating their time to um, this passion that they had, they weren't able to earn any money. And so some people were um, were not able to work because they were, they were the trustee of the charity and some people were having to step away from that to, because they had to work. So you, we've all got to pay our bills in some way, shape or form. Most of us, some of us, don't have to but most of us have to pay bills and this was the reason the community interest company was brought in so that you could have charitable aims and have have these not-for-profit organizations um but that the the people that were on the board could actually earn some money from it because one of the things that you can't do i didn't speak about that earlier with trustees if you're a trustee of a charity you are not allowed to earn any money from that charity um, unless you've got express permission from the Charity Commission. And so it would only be in extreme cases that the Charity Commission would allow you, trustees to earn any money. And I can't even think of any circumstances. I haven't come across any trustees that have been given permission from the Charity to com Commission to earn any money. Most trustees are voluntary. Um, and I've heard of, there's been cases when People who have been a trustee of an organisation have then applied for a job with that charity. They would then step down from being a trustee if they were successful with that job with the charity. So trustees are volunteers. The difference is with community interest um, companies and also with companies limited by guarantee, you can pay your directors. Um, so that's why community interest companies were brought into being so that people that had really good things to do in their communities could earn a living at the same time as doing all these creative and wonderful things for the benefit of the community. So you have to have a benefit for the community um, with a community interest company and there's got to be an asset lock for a community interest company. So you're, um, it's a not-for-profit kind of um, setup. And so the money, the income that you, you're bringing in, you're then 
putting that back into the community. So the pros of, pros of this is the company can either be limited by a guarantee or shares. I actually was the CEO of a, a community interest company limited by shares and for us it was the worst thing that could have happened because we were unable to apply to the big lottery for funding. We were excluded from the majority of their funds because we were limited by shares. And despite our guarantee to them that the shares were just to show that we had the um, engagement from the local community, there was no money going into anybody's sh any shareholders' pockets, um, they, they would not give us any funding. And I, I'm pretty sure that's still the case now. So. If you're going to be a community interest company, if you're be very careful when you're looking at whether you're going to be limited by shares or by guarantee and just explore the implications of being limited by shares. And if you're going to be relying on grant funding and particularly wanting the big funding from places like Big Lottery, go and check out whether they will give you it before you set up as a community interest company or a CIC as they're always also known, limited by shares. <clears throat> so you can pay your directors, that's a, a, a bonus, it's a pro, um, and it's not restricted to charitable purposes. So you could set up for, a, there's an organisation currently setting up in Medway for environment. So it's not necessarily um, charitable, but it's it's for the good of the, the community. Um, and you can access certain funding available to social enterprises, but again, not all of it. So check that it's the right structure for you. Doesn't have the same tax advantages or business rate relief as charities and can't claim gift aid. You need to pass a community interest test and you need to have an asset lock. An asset lock isn't a physical thing. It's just a statement to say um, basically where you're going to put your money if the company went into administration, you'd move on to, um, if I understand it right, that to another charitable organisation. Um, I might be challenged on that, so I'm happy to be challenged on that and come back to you. Regulated by two bodies, Companies House and the CIC. Both the annual accounts and the CIC report are filed at the same time with Companies House. And again, don't be late or you're going to get some um, fines. So the 13 descriptions that we spoke about earlier, or I spoke about earlier, that um, this is, uh, I explained that MVA, our charitable objects fell within um, A, B and E, if I remember rightly. So these are our charitable objects to provide or assist the provision and development of fa facilities in the interest of social welfare, including social activities with the object of improving the conditions of life for the community and then why I'm here to advance education and learning so that's part of our um, remit and if we move over to the area of benefit so we primarily but not exclusively work within the Medway area and that's why I can come and deliver this training to you in Dover. Now, in our governing document, as, as you can see there, it gives you details of when we were set up. So we were set up in 1994 and then our governing document was amended in November 1998 and then again in January 2017. Now, the likelihood is that was amended because there was things that the charity wanted to do but couldn't in their governing document. So they had to make amendments to that governing document. Um, and that's what I suspect has happened um, for MVA. I just wanted to share that with you. I'm just conscious that we're running very close to time. Um, so I'm just going to fly through these last ones so that we've got time for some questions. Um, this is just the cost that you would have if you were for the different types of organisation that you would set up. Um, so I'm not going to read it out. It's there for you to, to, to access. And if you need further support, um, Dover District Council's community service teams are available to help. And there's the um, email address in there. Should you need support, just drop them a line and they can advise you 
where to go um, for that support. That then takes us to Q&A um, and then after that we've got the links. I'm just going to quickly show you the links here. You'll get that in your, your slide pack. So lots of links there to lots of different information. And we have packed a huge amount into that one hour. So my apologies if I was running like a train and I hope you understood it. I think that's it. Um, so the next part that we're going to look at, this is what we tried to do was separate the two parts so that um, it didn't either go over people's head or it didn't bore people silly. So, but also it's also a follow on from the first session. The second session is about when you've established your group. So my question to the established groups that are out there are, do you know your legal structure? Um, even if you're a trustee, or you're a committee member, or you're on the board or something, do you know the legal structure of that group? Because not everyone does. Um, are you incorporated? Are you unincorporated? So that would be the first question that I would be suggesting you go away from here and find out if you don't know, are you an incorporated or unincorporated group? And if you are an unincorporated group, what are the implications for your group or your organisation around the legal structure and bearing in mind all the things that we spoke about in the first section session? Um, so this is just a recap, just in case we had new people coming on, but I'm not going to go through it because we don't have new people coming on. But so just go back and review that unincorporated legal structures and the implications of being an unincorporated legal structure and then you've got the the differences for the incorporated legal structure so just to refresh your memory you've got um your co your constitution is your rules and your regulations and your parameters and then your legal structure is how you are set up to run whether you are identified as a legal organisation in its own right or whether you are a group of individual members of society that have come together to do a good thing but you all hold that liability individually. Okay um, so the second part we were wanting to look at the charity governance so you've got your charity set up um, or you've got your organisation set up and what governance, what things do you need to think about? So the governance is what are your, um, what are the expectations of your organisation? What are the expectations of your trustees, of your board of directors? What can the public expect um, from a charity? What can the public expect from a limited company? What do the government expect from charities and community and and um, limited companies and so we've got two sets of codes we've got the um, charity governance code which has seven principles and the principles of the seven um, seven principles of the charity governance code are what you as an organization that has a charitable status attached to it must be not should be you must be operating with these in mind so you must have organisational purpose, and if you're a trustee, or even if you're a, um, if you're an employee of an organisation, a charitable organisation, you should know what your organisation's purpose is. So if you don't, if if I'm if I asked you right now, what is your organisation's purpose, and you can't tell me it, that's what I would be advising you to do. Go and do some research and research and all these other things if you don't know what they are at this minute in time that's your homework when you go away from here um, and I'm not going to mark it so don't get worried um, it's your homework for your organisation for your trustee board your director board to look at these things and make sure that you are addressing them and you're not not everybody's most people aren't going to have 100% and and in an ideal world, we would have 100% of these ticked off, but we don't live in an ideal world. So as long as you're working your way towards making sure and you're keeping these things in mind as you are operating your charity, your 
um, company, then you'll be fine. And as I said before, charity, the Charity Commission isn't there to come down on you like a ton of bricks. It's there to help you and it's the same with the community interest company, regulators, they're there to help you and companies' houses there to help you. The organisations that they will come down hard on are organisations that they've tried to help, they've given advice to um, improve their um, organisation status and, and how they adhere to all these principles. And those organisations have just ignored it because they, for whatever reason, and if they come back and they try and help you time and time again, that's when they'll start to come down with you on a ton of bricks. Um, they're not going to make an example of you on the first time, but they might make an example of you after repeated um, occurrences of the same sort of things. So use them. They're there. They're free. Use them to get your support as well as um, Dover District Council and the internet's a fabulous place. It's got loads of um, resources out there. The, you've got NCVO, which is the National Council for Voluntary Organisations. You've got um, the FSI, which is the Foundation for Social Improvement. Um, most of your organisations will fall under their, their remit and you'll be able to get some support from them as well. And depending on your income stream, you could get that free support or if you've got high income stream, you might have to pay a small membership for them. The links to those organisations are in those links that are in this document too. So Charity Governance Code, seven principles, organisation purpose is number one. Know what your organisation is about. Number two is leadership. There must be leadership from your trustee board. So, um, and it's got to be good leadership. So there's a responsibility there from trustees to lead the organisation to meet the charitable purposes that is outlined in your constitution and your charity documents, your governing documents. Integrity. Well, we all we all want our leaders to have integrity. Um, charity trustees need to prove that they've got integrity. They need to be delivering and their volunteering role with integrity at all times because not only does it look bad on them as individuals if they break that, it's bad for the charity's um, reputation and there's reputational risk there. So all of these principles here are about protecting the charity, the organisations, reputational risk and also legal risk because these are legal obligations that you've got to make sure that you're running the charity in the correct way that it should be run. So integrity is really, really important. Decision making, risk and control. Um, as a board, the trustees should be regularly having an oversight of what's happening within the organisation and maintaining is this a risk that this organisation can take? Is it something that um, is this this kind of behaviour that we want to be associated with this charity? Um, and for that, you've got to the, the trustee board need to prove that they are making decisions in the correct way. And they're not just making offhanded decisions. I haven't come across a trustee board that does that, but this is why these principles are here so that um, if there was any trustee boards that were just haphazard in how they run things, they're able to be held to account. So decision making, always make sure that you're documenting your decisions that you're making and that there's a clear um, process that you follow with your decision making. And then, again, there's lots of tools and techniques out there to help you with it, your decision making. Foundation for Social Improvement run really, really cost effective courses on different things like decision making and your role as a trustee starting at £5, so £5, £25, so they're really cost effective for you. So if you've never come across it, Foundation for Social Improvement, I don't get any commission from them. I'm just putting that out there. Um, board effectiveness. 
you've got to make sure you've got an effective board. You don't want a board that just comes together. And, and unfortunately, I've I've come across some of these boards, not currently, not in my current role, but previously in the past, um, come across boards that people are excited to be on a board. They want to be on the board for the prestige that comes with saying I'm a trustee of this board. Um, and they want to turn up to the meetings and they're happy to turn up to the meetings and get tea, coffee and sandwiches when we used to do sandwiches in the good old days. And um, you're lucky if you get tea and coffee these days. Um, but when it comes to actually helping run the organisation and they might ha be happy to, to do to make decisions and be part of the decision making process, but they're not prepared to put the commitment and the time commitment um, and the dedication involved to take things forward. So the sorts of things that I'm thinking about are particularly with small organisations, trustee boards with a small organisation, the likelihood is you're going to get involved in some operational stuff as well as the higher level stuff if you've not got any staff to do the everyday stuff. Um, and so if you're a member of a board of a small organisation like that, you need to be ready to roll your sleeves up and get involved. For other to, and, and when that, that board grows, you can then step back and just have that strategic overview that the board um, should have and, and should take, but you don't have to get involved in the operational stuff. But the majority of the organisations, certainly that we support in Medway, are micro organisations. They are small organisations and quite often the majority of them are lucky if they've got paid staff. It's volunteers that are running the whole show, so um, they need to roll their sleeves up. But if you have got people on the board that aren't rolling their sleeves up, that are not doing their fair share of the um, the day to day business, if you need to do that day to day business, they're not getting involved in policy, reviewing policies um, or any actions that you need to take as a board, then I would be advising you to look at your board, come together as a board, make sure that you've got your expectations of board members clear, your trustees that you're clear as a trustee what the expectations are and that again there are roles and responsibilities of trustees out there that you can use you don't have to start from scratch and make it up yourself just google it use those resources that i'm sending you the links to use dover district council support that you've got there equality diversion and inclusion is a one of the new ones that come in and it does what it says it does in the tin it's all about making sure that your board is is equal it's you've got equal access to that board for people from all walks of life um races genders um religions and you want your board to reflect the members or the people that you support your beneficiaries so if you've got a your board members are white male and a lot of your beneficiaries are from um, ethnic minority groups or female groups. You want to be getting that um, to be reflected on your board. Um, and you, the other thing about the the board makeup is you need to be looking. It's, so it's not just in terms of um, race or gender. It's you've got to have a diverse board, so diverse um, knowledge and experience and things that people bring to the board. If everybody has got the same experience on that board, it's not going to be a very effective board and it's not going to be diverse board and it's not going to, not going to be inclusive. Um, so it's about really sitting down thinking about, OK, what's our board makeup look like at this minute in time? Have we got spaces? And what space, those spaces that we do have, what gaps do we have? What do we need to do in order to have an equal, diverse and an inclusive board? And the last principle of the board is to be open and accountable. So openness, transparent, accountable to your beneficiaries. Um, and there's lots of um, 
things out in the, the world at this minute in time. I'm not going to talk about any specifics, but there's lots of examples of where organisations haven't been open, haven't been transparent, haven't been accountable. So look at those um, scenarios that have happened, those stories that are circulating and use them as examples of things. That's what you don't want to do. You want to do the absolute opposite. You want to be open for your beneficiaries, accountable for them and transparent and speak the language because if you don't speak the same language as your beneficiaries, then you're not accessible to them um, and you're not inclusive. So don't panic because there's help here. Um, and this here is the governance app. So this is a free um, dashboard. It's it's on the computer, so it's online and you have to sign up to it. Um, but once you sign up, it's free to sign up and I'm just going to log into my control panel. I've logged in already. Look at that. I was I was well prepared. Um, so what this, gov this governance app does for you, this dashboard does for you, is it helps you as a trustee board and I would also say you could use it if you were a board of directors um, because it's kind of similar things. And when I was when I supported the CEO, when I was the CEO of the community interest company, what I did was I advised our board to use the same, follow the same principles as a charity. And then we would absolutely know that we we were hitting the right things. And so you could use this, even if you were a community interest company, you could use this to kind of just monitor that you're hitting the right kind of tone for your community interest company. But what it does is it asks you questions. So you signed up, you sign up to this um this app and it asks you questions and you can answer those questions you can ask those questions to your trustee board when you're in the trustee meetings you could have subgroups to look at these different points so you could have a subgroup that's looking at their organizational purpose a subgroup for integrity and so on and so on and you could discuss that as subgroups and then bring it back to the the main um, board meeting when you have it and discuss it and share these are where we think we we meet these things and we are quite confident that we are covering these things well, but these things we think we might have a little bit of work to do. So, and you can use that as a plan once you assess. So it's like a self-assessment for you and you do get a, um, a mark at the end of it, which can help to indicate where the improvement is needed for your board. Nobody's going to come and wrap you on the knuckles for not for not um, scoring high in this. This is just purely for you to use internally with your board. Um, and then you can from this app make a plan, a way forward for you to um, bring the bits, the standards up where you're, you're maybe lacking or you might not have any diversity on your board at this minute. So that's a plan for your future recruitment for your trustees going forward. So that's just sharing that up um, so that you can use that to help you when you're looking at these um, seven principles of the charity code. I'm just going to go back to my presentation. <clears throat> so that's the app. Have a look at it. It might not be good for your board. It's not going to be good for everybody, but it's a tool. Lots of tools out there. And that's part of this um, session today is to highlight all these tools that are out there and give you um, signpost you to that so that you can use them if it is suitable. So then we come to the seven duties of a company director. And as I said before, they're very similar to the the governance code. So the duties of a company director, which would fall within director of a, a limited company or the di directors, the board within the community interest company. So your duty one is to act within power. So similar to the, the um, organisation purpose, excuse me, duty to promote the success of the company, to exercise independent judgment, to exercise reasonable care, skill and diligence with your organisation. And all again, this all comes back to protecting 
the reputational your your organization's reputation um and if you don't then you've you've, you've got reputational risk there and it's really difficult to build up your reputation with organisations, with other VCS organisations, with local authorities, with CCGs, with other funders. So what you don't want to do is drop the ball as a trustee board and then put your organisation at risk. And because if you lose all that reputation that you've, that good reputation that you've built up, it's going to take you a lot longer to get it back than it did to build it. And you can you you can lose it in the blink of an eye. So it doesn't, it might have taken you years to build up, but it only takes one thing for you to lose it. So as a board of directors or a trustee board, it's your responsibility to make sure you've got this overview, this strategic overview of all these things. And this is your duty as a company director to do that. Conflict of interest is very um, interesting and very, it can be quite tricky sometimes because you might find that um, you, the board members that you've got on your board also sit on lots of other different boards. So I'm um, remembering back to the community interest company that I was in, um, one of, a couple of our trustees, or sorry, a couple of our directors were also trustees or directors of other local organisations. So there were times when during the board meeting we might say, OK, Joe, could you step out for this next agenda item because we're going to discuss this and there's a conflict of interest because you also sit on that board. So Joe would step out, you'd discuss it, Joe would come back in. Um, so you need to avoid those conflicts of interest. But in a, it's really difficult to... to you, what I wouldn't do is try and have people that are not on any other boards because that's really difficult because you find that people who are prepared to come and volunteer and be on your board are likely the people that will volunteer for other things. So it's it's always the case that people that are on these boards are the busiest of people. So their um, time is stretched across lots of different charitable organisations and if you don't and if you've got people on your board that this is their one and only you're really lucky keep them keep them interested keep them um happy because you want as long as they're good for your board you want to keep them on the board um and the next one the accepting um benefits from third parties so again this is personal interest conflicts of interest and personal interest so if um so say for instance you've got a board of somebody's on your board that offers services so their their daytime job offers services and you're looking to contract an organization that organize that offers those particular services when you're in a community interest company, that's a lot easier to do. But if you're a trustee, then that's where the conflict of interest can get really, really tricky because directors of community interest companies, we touched on before, can be paid for services. Um, but it might be that that service that's offered is a really specialist service and there's no other organisations locally that are offering it. And so it might be that it's the right organisation to go with. So although there's a conflict of interest there, it's an appropriate conflict of interest and you just need to um, deal with that conflict of interest. And so you might find at the beginning of your board meetings, you ask, is there any conflicts of interest? And people declare those conflicts of interest. And then those decisions are made of whether that person needs to leave whilst that agenda item is being discussed. Um, and again, that last point is about interest in proposed transaction or arrangement. So that's what I've just touched on there. So very, very similar, the duties of directors to the um, duties of trustees. Um, this next slide is talking about when looking for trustees. So you might have trustees, you might have a good mix of trustees when you start your company, but as the year goes on and the years goes on and, and company, companies develop or um, people's lives develop, trustees come and go. You might have that 
your governing document says trustees can only stay for a certain number of years and then they have to step down. So check your governing documents to make sure you understand what that what the rules are for your particular organisation. Recruiting trustees isn't very easy. There's not always lots of people that are wanting to be trustees. But again, that's yeah, I guess I can't generalise because there will be some categories, there will be some parts of the voluntary and community sector organisations where people are really, really passionate about something and it's a, so I don't know, for, it might be a children's charity, so there's lots of people that want to get involved in children's charity. It might be, I don't know, acquired brain injury where there's lots of or, lots of passionate individuals who have been affected their own family have been affected so they want to give back and that's a good way of giving back to um to become a trustee of an organization but it's not don't take it as read that it's easy to recruit trustees full stop or that it's good it's easy to recruit the right trustees and the right number of trustees so you've got to look at your trustee board what's the current mix <clears throat> What's missing? Diversity. Is there have you got disabled people on your trustee board? Um, particularly, well, most of the most um organisations will be supporting disabled people. Um, so have you got any disabled people on your trustee board? Do you need to make any adaptations to or provide additional support in order for a disabled person to come onto your board? Think about that. How can you make your board accessible? What kind of trait are you looking for in your trustee? Don't just take somebody because they say I'm available. I want to be your trustee. You need to look at are you going to be a good fit? So you need to be doing like a recruitment process like you would be recruiting for a paid member of staff. Have a role description. Have a person specification about what kind of person are you looking for what kind of skills and what you could do with your board if you don't know at the minute <clears throat> is to do like a skills audit to see what what skills do your current trustees have and what are you missing um so almost everybody can be a trustee um and almost everybody can be a director um, you need to be over the age of 18 generally um, and not have been disqualified as being a trustee or a director or have um, undischarged bank bankrupt. Sorry, I'm losing my voice here, talking too long. Or have certain unspent criminal convictions. So the majority of people can be trustees, but not everybody can be trustees. And some trustees also need to have um, DBS checks, but not all trustees have to be DBS checked. So. These are the sorts of things you need to think about. What kind of work, what kind of support are you giving your beneficiaries? Does it fall within the definition of regulated activity under the Direct Disclosure and Barring Service? If it falls within that those categories, then the likelihood is you as trustees will need to have a disclosure and barring check too because you're responsible for the people who would need that disclosure and disclosure and barren check, the ZBS check. Top traits of a great trustee are that they're able to listen um, because you need to know what your staff, if you've got staff, your volunteers, if you've got your volunteers and your beneficiaries, you need to hear their voices. So if you're not a good listener, then improve your listening skills because you need to be good at listening. Another top trait is to be committed. As I spoke about earlier, it's not just good enough to rock up at um, board meetings, have a cup of tea and make decisions and go away. Sometimes it might be if you've got a big organisation with paid staff and loads of volunteers that are not on the board. Um, but the majority of the organisations we work with in the VCS organisations don't have that um, luxury. Challenge, you need to be able to challenge. So as a trustee or a board member, um, you need to be able to challenge appropriately. So it's not just the case of just sitting there and taking what the CEO or the staff rep or the volunteer rep is telling you has read. If things don't kind of make sense to you, if, if there are red flags going up in your head, 
challenge them, but challenge them appropriately. Don't go on a power trip. Um, so there's got to be challenge there, but it's got to be appropriate. And um, everybody needs to take that challenge. And I accept that when you're a new trustee or if you're a new member of staff, just going to these board meetings and you've never been to a board meeting before, it's really difficult and it can be really intimidating and you don't want to say anything in case you say the wrong things. And sometimes that's the case as well, even if you've been a trustee for a while, maybe you're a quiet trustee because you think, oh, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to ask this question because it might be a stupid question. No question is stupid and you, I would advise you to ask that question because the likelihood is that there'll be other people around the table that are also wanting to ask that question and are also thinking I don't want to ask that question in case it's stupid. But also it's your responsibility for a trustee to ask those questions because that's your role is to make sure you understand what's going on in your organisation. Be transparent. Um, so be open in your governance and um, be open in what other um, conflict of interest that you've got. Don't hide it because you want to be on that organisation. Be open. You should be able to find a way around it to be on that, that board and still hold that office, whatever it is that's the conflict of interest. Um, but be open and transparent. It's the best way forward because if you don't, and you found out later on down the line, then <clears throat> it's, it's not a good thing. It's going to be worse for you later on down the line than it is being open and transparent at the beginning. And of course, that's one of the, the um, principles of a trustee. And it's also one of the um, rules of the duties of a, a board of directors. So being a good team player as well, we spoke about rolling up your sleeves and getting stuck in to help out wherever there's gaps, sometimes, not all the time. Um, so you've got to be a good team player, that's the best. If you get somebody that's got most, if all of them would be perfect, but if you've got a good mix of these, then you've got a good trustee there. And the ones that, the, the, if you've, you've got people that've got some, but they don't have all, then you as an organisation can look to develop their skills, their knowledge and their experience in those areas that they don't currently have those skills. And being curious, be a nosy person. Um, it's not a bad thing. And uh, you need to you need to understand the roles and responsibilities of not just you as a trustee or a director, but of the staff and the volunteers that you've got within your organisation. You need to understand what the organisation does. You need to shadow them, go and shadow them for a day. They'll probably be um, really glad that you've done that because quite often if you're a trustee or a board member, there's organisations that the staff and the volunteers never see you. So like an MVA, we have um, team building days with trustees and it's an opportunity to get together volunteers, staff, trustees, so volunteers that aren't trustees, because of course our trustees are volunteers too, but it's a great opportunity to get together, to start building those relationships with each other. And that's really important, especially if you get a small organisation. It's a bit more difficult to do if you've got a bigger organisation. <clears throat> Just a wee quick drink. Other things that you need to consider are your AGM meetings and your general meetings. Now, your governing document that we spoke about way back at the beginning um, will set out the expectations of your regular meetings. So make sure you go back and you regularly refresh what yourself and remind yourself what your governing document says. What number of people do you have to have a meeting that's quoted? Um, so a, a quoted meeting is a meeting that's it's a bona fide meeting. It's it's so it might be that you need to have three members in order for the decisions that you make to be um, justified and to be taken forward. If you only meet, if there's only two of you, then that's not a quorum meeting, so it's not going to be considered a proper meeting in the, the eyes of the law, if you like. Um, AGMs, now I know during the first two years of COVID, it was really difficult for AGMs to get together. In some organisations, you might have it in your document that you can do your AGMs remotely. 
but most didn't. Um, so they, were, they relaxed the regulations around having to have annual AGMs, and that's what it is, annual AGM, annual general meeting. However, that stopped. So if you haven't been informed of that and you don't know and you don't, you, you thought that that was still the case. It's no longer the case now. It stopped, I think, in April or May of this year. So the regulations are back to pre-COVID that you've got to have your um, AGMs. So go back to your governing document and check what your expectations are. It's generally like you've got to give 14 clear days of notice to your members um, that you're going to have an AGM and give them the documents, etc. But I would advise you to do it in advance, more in advance than that, if you can. Um, 21 clear days or even longer if you've got the, the luxury of time. So the typical business that you conduct at an annual general meeting, an AGM, is you go through the annual report, accounts, um, you share that with the members, you should send it out to the members of your organisation beforehand as well <clears throat> so they get it and they're able to analyse it and scrutinise it so that they can come with questions on the day um, and then you approve the appointment or the reappointment of the auditors if you've got auditors and the appointment or reappointment of trustees. Um, most organisations, so your AGM part might only take half an hour most organisations will couple that with another event. Um, it might be to showcase all the fantastic and amazing stuff that your organisations have done since the last AGM. And then so you have your business set part of the AGM and then the celebration part of the AGM. Um, but it's entirely up to you how you run the AGM. Um, but go back to your governing documents and make sure that you're running that AGM in line with what your governing documents say. Other things to consider are accounts. Um, so depending on the size of your organisation, your setup is will depend on what, what whether you need to have your accounts audited. Most organisations, um, they just need to, to have an, exa uh, an external examination of their accounts because they fall within the threshold. Um, it's only your larger organisations that need to um, do the full full-blown whistles and um, I can't remember what the rest of that saying is so I'll just move on. Um, <clears throat> if you're a small organisation that has an income below £25,000 then um, you don't even need to have an exam, oh, you do have to, all you need to have is an examination of your, your accounts um, you don't have to have it audited because it costs to audit so they're not going to get you to audit your accounts if you've not got enough money coming in. That just doesn't make sense. But make sure you keep clear documented accounts and receipts of all the stuff that's coming in and all the stuff that's going out. Um, and make sure that if you've got restricted income coming in, that you identify that on your accounts, that it's restricted funding. Restricted funding, if you don't know what that is, is funding that you've been given for a particular thing that you can't spend on anything. Unrestricted funding is just funding that's been given to you and you can decide what you're going to spend on. Um, but most funding these days is given as restricted. Your unrestricted might be if you were doing community fundraising, um, maybe uh, if you were doing fundraising um, on gift aid or something that might be unrestricted so make sure you know how much of your funding that's coming in is restricted and how much is unrestricted and make sure that's clear on your your accounts um and this is this is just a, a thing that i've included um that there was a couple of years ago back in 2016 there was changes to your accounts so most of your organizations if not all of them should know about these um but i've just put that in in case you didn't um or if you're a new and if you're a new organization starting up now you don't you wouldn't know what happened before 2016 anyway but it's just a kind of accounts whereas um in the past you were able to give a certain kind of accounts to your members and a different Account, type of accounts for the public. Now you've got to give the same kind of accounts to the public and to your members of your organisation. 
So I'd like to say thank you to Tricia uh, again for your invaluable advice, and I'm sure it helped everybody. Um, and all those here, if you could fill out your your feedback forms, and those online, if you or those who are on Teams, could you fill out your feedback forms? Other than that, thank you very much indeed again once again, Tricia. Thank you very much for for all of you for attending, and I hope you have a good evening and a safe journey back for those who are in the chamber here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.